Morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, let me welcome you to the 13th meeting in 2014 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee and remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, we've received apologies today from Cara Hilton and Mark Griffin is here uh, attending as, uh, as substitute. Uh, first item uh, today is for the committee to agree that its consideration of a paper on hybrid bills and the Scotland Act 2012 finance changes should be taken in private at future meetings. Do members agree to take these items in private? Great. Great. Thank you. Agenda item two is for the committee to agree to take agenda item six and seven uh, in private agenda. Item six is consideration of the committee's work programme. And agenda item seven is a discussion on committees meeting at the same time as the chamber. Do members agree to take these items in private? Yes. Thank you very much. That brings us neatly to agenda item three, uh, which is uh, evidence on the annual report in 2013-14 of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. And I'm pleased to welcome Bill Thompson, Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland, and Ian Bruce, the Public Appointments Manager, Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. And let me particularly welcome uh, Bill Thompson to his new role as Commissioner. Uh, we will grill you mercilessly, just as we would expect you <coughs> to grill us mercilessly in other circumstances. Um, and let me invite you to uh, say a few words by way of introduction. Thank you, Convener. I don't want to say too much by way of introduction. Um, as you're aware, the report covers the period uh, 2013 to 2014, which was the last year in office of my predecessor, Stuart Allen, and I have acknowledged in the foreword the substantial contribution which he has made to the development uh, of ethical standards in public life in Scotland. I took up office on the 1st of April, um, just after the period covered by the report, uh, thankfully Ian Bruce was involved throughout uh, in all of the public appointments activities which are reflected in it, uh, including the consultation uh, which led up to the issue of the revised Code of Practice in October 2013. Uh, there have been relatively few appointment rounds under that code in the period covered by the report, but there have been significantly more since then. Uh, and so we are both very happy to do our best to answer questions on the period covered by the report, uh, and if you wish, uh, on matters which have happened since then. And that's all I want to say by way of introduction. Uh, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, the members have a number of questions, and we'll see how we get on. And of course, the answers may lead us to other questions of which we have yet to think. Uh, so let me start with Margaret. Thank you, and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, the Commissioner states in the report that he received 21 complaints uh, during the last year. 18 complaints were found to be inadmissible, and three complaints were withdrawn. So there was no breach to report to the SPPA committee. Can, can you outline the reasons why all complaints about MSPs were found to be inadmissible in the last reporting year, resulting in no breach reports coming to this committee? I hope the committee isn't disappointed by these circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it's a good outcome. Um, a lot of complaints cover conduct which is perceived by the person complaining to be a breach of the key principles. Um, and of course, there is no report to you if the issue is simply a breach of the key principles. And that applies to the codes of conduct for councillors and members of public bodies. And by the way, um, there were 311 complaints about um, conduct by councillors. Um, and again, there, most of those were inadmissible. Some are inadmissible simply because they're not within my jurisdiction at all. Um, people complain about quite a wide range of things, um, some of which are not covered by the code in any way. Um, I'm happy to provide you with 
in writing, if you would like, um, because I don't have it all in my head at the moment, the specific circumstances or reasons uh, for treating those 18 complaints as inadmissible. Um, I don't think there's any secret to it. Most of them are just irrelevant um, or relate to an, an apparent breach of the key principles and nothing specific under the code. That would be useful if you could. Uh, yes, certainly send provide us. that. Thank you. Uh, I, don't, I have no further questions at this time. Uh, it might be worth just, uh, you made reference to um, there being 311 uh, counts, uh, complaints about councillors. It might be just useful to say, of course, there are many more councillors than MSPs. Absolutely. So uh, although that, my quick back of the envelope suggests that's 25% of councillors, I mean, numerically, and 15% of MSPs, I think that's close enough to be in the same sort of territory. Indeed, there are over 2,000 councillors. Oh, there are 2,000, no? Over 2,000. Mm -hmm. Sorry, 1,200, I beg your ah, pardon. Yes. Well, yes, I'm, it's I'm, about, I'm, about 10 times. I'm, I'm glad we agreed that, yeah. because certainly I had 1,222 I used yeah. as my sum. But there we are, not to worry. Um, Mark Griffin. Just a, can I ask a supplementary, just on that point? You said that the, the reason those uh, complaints didn't come to us because a lot of the complaints were out with... Um, your remit. Uh, do you have a view on um, the nature of those complaints and whether um, that remit should be extended to allow you to to cover those complaints that were discharged? I do. Um, I can't envisage a situation in which the Parliament would agree to a code which would cover all of the complaints which come into my office. Um, and I'm not looking for any extension of the jurisdiction. Um, there's already a pretty extensive code, as you well know, um, to be observed by members. Um, it, I think it's reasonably complicated, um, and I wouldn't be looking to complicate it further. Okay, thanks. Uh, we, we've got you down for some... What's it? Cameron. Oh, it's, I beg your pardon, it is Cameron. You're top of my page now, my eyes slipped. Beg your pardon. You produced, uh, good morning, you produced morning. a revised code of practice in 2013, which we scrutinised, including taking evidence from the former commissioner. The annual report says that the revised code of practice increased flexibility and encourages bureaucracy. Is that, have these changes made a difference to that, increasing flexibility? I think, have they succeeded in increasing flexibility and reducing bureaucracy, or encouraging bureaucracy? So, encouraging reduced bureaucracy, sorry. <laughs> encouraging bureaucracy. <laughs> the word reduced, I missed that. I don't sorry. think any of us wishes to encourage bureaucracy. No, I agree with you do. on that. Um, I think in the period covered by the report, uh, the number of appointment rounds which took place under the 2013 Code was too small to draw any conclusions. But, as I said... I think there have now been 46. I got one figure wrong, but Ian will correct me. I think there have now been, in total, 46 appointment rounds under the revised code issued in October 2013. Uh, and yes, there are signs of um, the process being, in some ways, less bureaucratic uh, and more flexible. And if you wish, I think we can give you some specific examples. Um, and if you want me to... One would be... Of interest, Could you, can you give me? Do yeah, you I, th I think um, I'll refer to Ian for that if you're happy. Yeah, certainly. Um, a few appointment rounds have been trying new approaches to um, the appointment process, which is one of the things that we uh, are aware that um, the committee and other stakeholders were encouraging. Um, Quite a few I can um, draw the committee's attention to. Um, most recently, we have an appointment round for Historic Environment Scotland. Um, it's one of the ones on which one of our uh, advisors has been invited to um, take part. Um, and there, the approach to assessment um, is very different to that which has traditionally been used. So in terms of flexibility, we, we are encouraging panels to, to take on the opportunity to try new approaches to application and assessment, and that's quite different to the traditional um, written application form addressing all the criteria for selection. 
followed by an interview. Um, in this particular case, uh, and it's one of a few cases in which this approach has been tried, um, panels are looking to simulate the sorts of activities that board members will be involved in once appointed. Um, and it's a, it's a much better indicator of how effective they will be once that appointment has taken place. Um, and again, I, you know, we'd be more than happy to provide um, written evidence after today's committee on, on the range of approaches that are now being tried and the success of those. Yeah, you give an example, that's, that's probably enough, that's fine. fine. Oh, good. Thank you very much. Not at all. all right. No further questions, thank you. Thank you. In that case, I will invite Mark. Maybe I've answered some of this point already, but you able to outline how the <coughs> reduction in scrutiny, particularly changes to the role of the assessor under the revised code, is operating in practice and what the impact um, of that approach has been? I, I'm not sure if you're asking me to respond to that in terms of outcomes. I, I don't think you... I don't imagine you're suggesting that a reduction in scrutiny will lead to different outcomes. What I'm concerned about is that appointments continue to be made um, in accordance with the code um, and also, where possible, to encourage and support um, moves to encourage greater diversity on boards. Um, and against that background, uh, I have no evidence that the change has led to any departure from the code um, or made it more difficult for <coughs> diversity to be achieved. I think um, it's perhaps important to mention that we have changed the, the name and actually the nature of the role uh, which is played by the people referred to as public appointments assessors in the report on 2013-14. Um, as of early in this financial year, we have called them advisors. Now, that may not seem much of a change, uh, but it does reflect uh, a deliberate attempt to work more closely with the, if I can use uh, Mr Buchanan's term, the bureaucracy which is involved uh, in actually conducting the appointment process, um, both to monitor but principally to guide, advise and support. Um, and there have been quite a significant number of um, rounds which have been treated as falling into the high category, so the advisor has been involved. Um, and when we give you the examples of changes in practice, I think you'll find that advisors have played a role in that. So I think in terms of the way the resources are applied and the options for reducing the amount of bureaucracy, I, I think the outcome is positive. Okay, I mean, I, I think my question was based on sort of a follow-on from Mr Buchanan's question about reducing bureaucracy but still making sure that the assessor still has um, an, a, an appropriate role and, and that the role of scrutiny wasn't um, decreased because of perhaps too much reduced bureaucracy. But as long as, um, I'd just ask that as long as you're satisfied that there has been an adequate um, level of scrutiny in the, in the process for the assessor. At the, at the moment, I am. Um, I should say there are two caveats. One is um, a, a measure of satisfaction, it's not the only one, would be whether or not I receive complaints. Um, and there were no complaints under this revised code which led to uh, any finding of a material breach. So that's a good thing in itself, but it's not a complete answer. Um, we are about to conduct... Um, uh, working with the uh, government staff who are involved, uh, a thematic review of the rounds which took place. Um, and that will be selective, but we will not just be looking at those which had a, a public appointments advisor or assessor involved. So we will sample some of the others as well. Um, I'm afraid we won't have the answers uh, until sometime early in the next financial year. Um, but I might be able to come back to you on that if you're still okay. interested in that point. OK, thank you. Richard. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Um, can I ask you in regards to the revised Code of Practice? The revised Code of Practice encourages ministers to appoint an independent panel member 
on the selection panel, particularly in cases where the Commissioner has not assigned an assessor as a panel member. Are Ministers appointing independent panel members uh, to selection panels where there is no assessor involved, and how are independent panel members selected? Yes, they are appointing independent panel members. Um, I think I mentioned before there have been 46 rounds um, since the 2013 Code came into effect. Uh, independent panel members have been appointed to um, very nearly 50% of those, including ones where there was no advisor directly involved. Um, and I think I'll ask Ian to answer your more detailed question about how they're appointed. Um, yes, um, I mean, officials did seek our advice on what they want to take into account when looking to identify independent panel members. Um, and we'd suggested that most public bodies have key stakeholder groups, the people that one might consult with about proposals for change. Um, and in certain cases, they may have stakeholder groups who are perhaps critical of uh, the activities that they engage in. Um, but clearly, you know, that, that brings a, a challenge role um, when, when someone's involved as a selection panel member. We've been very heartened um, by the involvement of stakeholders, in particular in selection panels. Uh, there's a round ongoing for Creative Scotland at the moment. And, and two of the independent panel members there have been drawn from the artistic community. Um, other examples, um, the Schools Closure Review Panel are appointing a convener and the head of the, I think it's the National Parent Forum for Scotland, has been involved uh, as an independent selection panel member there. Um, another particularly interesting one, the president of the Chartered Institute of Taxation as a panel member for the Revenue Scotland appointment round. Uh, the National Confidential Forum was um, establishing a, a forum, obviously, for victims of abuse to talk about their experiences. Um, and there, they actually involved um, uh, someone who'd suffered historic abuse um, as a selection panel member. So uh, we, we think there's a lot of thought, time, effort, consideration going into the selection of these uh, people. And obviously, the, you know, they, they are adding value to the activities of selection panels. So yes, it's something that's been taken very seriously. Uh, I, I certainly welcome the, the comments and, and welcome the fact that we are trying to involve people who uh, at most of the times criticise how people are, are appointed. Um, if I can move on, in the, in the report on the revised code, the committee had noted that the experience, uh, uh, the, the experience, that experience had been added to the criteria uh, used for making appointments. The previous commissioner explained that any selection uh, panel would want to know what experience a person could bring to a post. Do you believe, does the new commissioner believe or consider that adding the additional criteria of experience for making appointments has had an impact? And are you satisfied that it's not discouraging people from certain groups, for example, younger people, uh, from apply for applying for public appointments? Because younger people won't have experience, but they will have a knowledge, and the point has just been made earlier, they will bring something to the table. I, I think, Kavina, there, there are two questions in there. Um, and I know that this committee, albeit slightly differently constituted, um, did have some concerns at the time. Uh, about experience uh, being added. Um, I have no evidence as of now that it is causing problems. I, I appreciate entirely the point Mr Lyle's making about um, younger people find it more difficult. It's the, it's the catch-22. If you don't get the experience, how can you demonstrate it? Um, the thematic review, which I mentioned uh, in answer to one of Mr Griffin's questions, uh, will test this. Um, so that is one of the things we want to examine and see whether including experience specifically um, does have a detrimental impact on the range of people who are able to put themselves forward and therefore uh, be available to get through the process. As I said, we don't have any evidence at the moment that it is. <laughs> I think, however, this drives at a cultural issue which... Um, it's really terribly important. 
I think there's, I think it's very easy and very human and normal uh, to have confidence in people who appear to be like the people who've succeeded before. Um, and I think in attempting to improve the range of diversity on boards, which is widely recognised to be a good thing for, for a number of reasons, um, there's a barrier there which has to be got over. Um, and one of these factors is how relevant or what sort of experience is relevant. Um, I think there are some examples which, which Ian can expand on um, where uh, specific experience has been sought, not of the nature that would previously have been looked for in the, the paradigm I'm describing, where you look for the sort of person who succeeded before, uh, and particularly in the, the health sphere. So I'll, I'll hand over to Ian to give one example there. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, it, it's probably worth saying we've spoken to the committee in the past about using different application and assessment methods, um, but obviously, as the commissioners pointed out, the criteria for selection you can make the process more accessible, but ultimately it's only ever going to deliver what's asked for in the first place. Um, so a recent example where you know, we are trying new things and you know, our advisor is closely involved in that, Fife NHS at the moment, um, uh, and I think it's a very reasonable example, there they're looking for experience, particularly as a service user or as a carer of overcoming barriers. Now, uh, you know, that, that doesn't point to the typical picture that one may have in one's head of an odd executive, but um, it speaks directly to the drive for co-location and the health and social care agenda. So depending on how one defines experience, one, you know, one, one can find, you know, a, a more diverse people, um, a more diverse group of people considered suitable for appointment at the end of that process. So it, it's about ministers thinking differently about what they're looking for at the outset. You've actually picked on a, a, a group which, uh, and why I'm smiling, is uh, I've attended various functions and many MSPs have attended various functions where there are many young people who are caring for their parents, aunties, uncles, grannies, whatever, you know, uh, quite young people, you know, but even though they're young, uh, as, as they keep reminding me, and uh, um, you know, they have that life experience of caring. They also have a situation that they have views, which you know, we all were young once. Uh, we all had views, and, and many of us have not changed those views over the years. Um, so you know, I, I like the the, the 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 section that you, you selected because there's an example that a young person could be involved in that. Yes. Bring Fiona in. It's covered. it's covered, right? It's been covered. That's that's grand. Thank you. It, that's fine, Margaret. Thank you. Um, just moving on to delivering diversity. Um, in the annual report, it states that there has been limited progress, other than in the case of applicants and appointees who declare they are disabled. And significant progress will have to be made if the equality outcome of public appointments is going to be achieved. This will depend on generating higher numbers of good quality applications from currently underrepresented groups and ensuring that the appointment process itself is free from bias and other barriers. I mean, and, and I think the example you gave in, to the earlier question uh, was a good one along those lines. And it's bringing someone who's actually a, an end user uh, of a service. So what progress has been made towards meeting the targets set out in the diversity delivers? And are there plans to revise the strategy of or the targets? I think it's fair to say that progress has been slow. I wouldn't pretend otherwise. Um, I think disappointingly slow. And I, I think ministers share that view and are probably quite frustrated by it. Mm. Um, on the question of whether the strategy should be revised, I'm a little bit hesitant. Um, I know that Diversity Delivers dates from 2008 uh, and therefore might be seen by some to be quite old. Um, 
but I think it was based on sound analysis. And I think any further analysis which has happened since then tends to reinforce the position that was adopted um, in Diversity Delivers. Um, some of the recommendations which it makes are pretty straightforward. Um, I think if there's the political will there, and I, I believe there is, um, I think it's a question of <coughs> sufficient resources being made available to allow both some fairly simple uh, things to be done in terms of process, um, and also, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, uh, to keep working on, on changing the culture. Um, I don't think anyone is suggesting that the boards who are currently appointed are generally doing anything other than a good job. Um, there may be issues, of course, but um, generally, the process has delivered people who are capable of performing. Um, increasing diversity involves, for some people, taking a risk uh, on appointing people who are different from those who have been there up to now, and trusting that these people will be able to demonstrate through the appointment process that they've got what it takes in terms of skills, ability uh, and experience, and then be able to deliver it. And delivering it, of course, will require the chairs of the boards, which become more diverse, uh, to have the skills to exploit that diversity to good effect. So it's not a simple process. It's not something that will change just by you know, adjusting the pressure on a nut here or, or you know, moving a pipe somewhere else. There's, there's quite a lot that has to happen. Um, so although I think progress is disappointingly slow, um, if what is happening <coughs> involves change on a number of fronts which will all lead to the outcome which I think everybody agrees is desirable, um, then it's probably worth allowing a little bit more time for all that to happen. Mm -hmm. So in answer to your question about changing the strategy, I don't, I, I happily listen to views, but as currently advised, I don't think the strategy needs to change. Okay. Uh, what steps should be taken to generate higher numbers of good quality applications from currently unrepresented groups? I, I, mean, I mean, you mentioned risk, uh, but surely that shouldn't be a, why people should be eliminated if they're applying because, you know, there's a training factor may be required, and, you know, for new me board members, particularly of a certain underrepresented group, perhaps. Uh, absolutely not. I, I, I didn't mean to imply or argue that um, the risks which have to be taken at some point um, are a reason for shying away from looking for more diverse appointments. Far from it. Um, mm -hmm. The simple answer is that there are already um, steps set out in Diversity Delivers. They're set out very clearly there um, under three different categories. Some of those have been taken, some have not. Um, I think taking the others would move us a long way. Uh, and I'm quite encouraged by uh, some of the things which have happened even in the short period uh, since I took up office. Um, uh, as one of the committee knows very well, um, I did have a meeting with ministers last month uh, to discuss how they might use their role in defining merit um, to greater effect in seeking to uh, encourage more diverse people to be brought forward and, uh, and get through the process. Um, and I'm due to have a meeting towards the end of this month uh, with the some of the senior civil servants who are actually involved generally in chairing panels, appointment panels. Um, and I, Ian, and um, a very small number of other people in my office um, are working with uh, the civil servants in what used to be called PACE, the uh, Public Appointment Centre of Expertise, now called PAWD. Um, we're working with them um, on a number of actions um, which will address some of the process changes that need to take effect. Um, and, and when will that actually... Could, could I just invite, before we move on from what's been said, you re refer to steps not yet been taken. Could you be specific and perhaps put on the record what steps have not been taken? 
or would you require to write to us on that? I think it would be fairer all round um, if I were to send you that in writing. Right, that's um, fine. That's fine. Okay. Margaret. I am... Um, Yes, well, I'll, I'll move on then because there's a couple of examples uh, of diversity uh, in the report where uh, significant progress in the case of applicants and appointees who declare they are disabled with a rise from 2.4% to 13.1% representation on boards of public bodies. So what factors may have contributed to this increase in representation? And, you know... Why isn't that being replicated elsewhere? Um, I think that's quite a tricky question. Um, <coughs> and I'm not in favour of hospital passes, but um, given that I wasn't involved at the time, I, I think I'll have to ask Ian uh, if he has any anything that would help to elucidate. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. Sure. Um, I think the thematic review that we're about to undertake might answer uh, some of these questions. Uh, originally, what we'd anticipated was that the, the government itself would look at all of the processes that it runs to see where the barriers arise and how to address them. Uh, and the particular focus of the thematic review that we're uh, about to, to run is to assist the government uh, in, in that particular respect. So why are people falling out at um, different stages in the process? Why are some appointment rounds more successful at bringing people forward? Why, why are others not? Um, I can say that we saw a significant rise in application numbers and appointment numbers after we um, changed all the monitoring information that we gathered. So, uh, you know, it may be a matter of awareness on the part of applicants, but I don't know that that's the case. So uh, I, I can't give you an explicit, definite answer as to right, why so that, that rise has happened. So the will give us answers to those? Yes, not, not just in relation to disabled applicants, yeah. but all underrepresented groups. That's, that's the particular purpose of this thematic review. Um, as I say, we had anticipated that government would do this on a rolling basis, so learn from round to round. Um, and what we're hoping to do with the review is make some recommendations about how that learning can be embedded because there are clearly pockets of good practice. You can see that from the report. You know, some directorates are good at attracting people, but not particularly good when it comes to appointments. Um, you know, others are better at conversion rates later down the line. So what we're looking to do is identify what enables directorates to do well in some areas and what inhibits them and make some recommendations on the back of that. So when will we know the results of that review? Uh, we certainly intend to have all of the work completed by the time that the next um, annual report is due to be finished. So in this financial year, um, if you would like a copy of the report in advance of that, I'm sure we'd be very happy to provide that to the committee. Okay. Thanks. And I've got one more question on the same subject. And uh, the annual report highlights that the percentage of women on boards has barely risen from 34.5% over a period of almost 10 years. So the commis you, commissioner said that he welcomes the priority being given uh, by the Scottish Government to addressing this imbalance. But what factors have contributed towards the lack of progress uh, in recruiting more women to boards? And what steps have been taken to address this? Because I think, I'm sure this is one which is brought to your attention quite a lot. Uh, and I'm sure you are trying to rectify it, so perhaps you could tell us what it is you've been trying to do to overcome that and uh, why it hasn't been successful. I, I, think, um, I think ministers are acutely aware of this uh, and also very keen uh, to see what can be done. Um, as I understand it, the research which is available suggests in part uh, that it's down to um, women generally. I'm sorry, I hate generalising. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, but th there is research evidence that women generally um, are less likely to put themselves forward for something where they are not sure that they meet all of the criteria. Um, it seems that the male gender is less worried about having a go in these circumstances. Um, 
I think that's really dangerously simplistic, um, but it does seem to be a factor, um, which is why it's very important to put the effort in early on in the appointment process um, to identify clearly the, uh, the merit, as I said, that was identified on the basis of which appointment will be made mm -hmm. and what is being looked for, and then to make sure that that is clearly set out in the way that appointment is advertised in a way that makes it accessible <laughs> to people. Now, it sounds simple when you put it like that. Uh, it does require a fair amount of thought um, and learning from experience, which is precisely what we hope to uh, identify through the thematic review. Yeah, I mean, so what work has been done around, uh, you know, improving how you, you make the, the application and the advert for the, the board place uh, more attractive well, and more... Yep. You know, Ian's actually involved uh, in a subgroup of the programme board which the, the government has set up um, to, to look at uh, diversity, so I think I'll ask him if he would answer that specific question. Yeah, happily. Um, as the Commissioner's already identified, um, there were a number of recommendations in Diversity Delivers, uh, and I, th you know, I think being reasonable to government, they have done quite a lot, but it's, it's a very complex picture, and unless you implement everything, um, it's very difficult to say, well, you know, it hasn't worked, we need to try a new approach. Uh, things that have been done, uh, every advert now does include um, a positive action statement, you know, so we believe, you know, that that's helpful and it ought to encourage more people to apply. Um, the brand of the public body itself is being used on more occasions than it has been previously and, you know, that makes the advert more attractive. Um, things that haven't perhaps been done is more targeted um, attraction strategies and, and we anticipate that with the programme board having been established um, that more time will be taken to actually target the groups that are underrepresented. Um, the programme board's particular aim, the strand that we're working to is to have um, boards reflective of society in relation to gender so that you know 51.5 percent of you know the makeup of our the boards of our public bodies um, are, are made up of women. So, you know, gender parity is a particular aim and there are a set of actions um, that, that we do plan to undertake in order to, to hit that target. Um, but until all the recommendations that have been made by the office have been implemented, um, I don't think we're really in a position to say we, we, we've tried everything that we can. I mean, you know, the reality is that we haven't collectively tried everything that we can. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. You still want, Richard? Uh, two small, quick questions, if you allow me, convene it. Um, in regard to the point you just made there, Mr. Bruce, um, female, 35% to 51% of the Scottish population. But does the answer not lie in your in page 20? 29, table 25, does the answer not lie in the question I asked you a few minutes ago? Age 49 and under, uh, Scottish population 54.3%, but only 17.4% are on board. So is it not the fact that, the, with the greatest respect to us all, we're appointing, uh, you know, we're looking at the wrong age range, that maybe under the 49, uh, that, that could bring women on, which I agree with and support, uh, to encourage them to come along. Um, uh, there are more young, younger women councillors now in Scotland in, than ever there has been uh, because all parties have encouraged women to stand uh, and basically and also, sorry, before I so, so I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick are we not advertising in the wrong papers? What papers are we advertising with the greatest respects to the Scotsman the Herald or whatever uh, fashionable paper you read uh, most of the population don't read with the greatest respect to those newspapers, those newspapers. Yes. Um, very few um, positions are actually advertised in the Herald and the Scotsman. That's, that's not been the case for some time. Um, again, we, we do anticipate that government will look at the strategy that it's used for publicising opportunities and, and learn from that. And, you know, that, that's absolutely the purpose of this thematic review is, is to assist them with it. Um, most of the newspaper advertising is either for um, the likes of territorial health boards and local newspapers because we know that you know they have a better reach yeah. 
for national positions that are advertised in the press, it tends to be the Metro more than any other newspaper, to be honest with you. Um, but just advertising is, you know, it's, it's only a very small part of the story. Um, publicity has to be targeted, and it doesn't have to be targeted on a round-to-round -round basis. So I mean, there really has to be a communications campaign, and that has to be around targeting the groups that are currently underrepresented. Um, I would suggest you're absolutely right. Yes, yes. You know, we should be looking to attract younger people, um, and that's about um, visiting workplaces. Um, you know, there are blue chips on the edge of Edinburgh, uh, and we should be going there and, and encouraging the employers to let people time off to engage in this activity. Um, you know, it's certainly good in terms of social responsibility for employers. Um, it increases the skill set. Um, so these are the things that, that still have to be done. You know, I, I spoke earlier about the things that hadn't been implemented, uh, and I think these are the things that, that do have to be done still. Just quickly, if you allow me, um, you, you uh, briefly, very sure. briefly, councillors are allowed time off by their work by statute. Are, are ordinary people, uh, you agree with me that they are not allowed time off? If they were on a board, they would have a, a problem with their work? Some... I, there's no statutory right, um, which is why this is a complex picture, because um, uh, I, I don't think uh, diversity will be achieved fully just by taking people, for example, from blue chip companies. I'm, I have nothing against them at all. Um, obviously, a very good source of well-qualified people. But in terms of diversity, um, the whole socioeconomic issue has to be considered. Um, and what people have to give up in order to be on a board uh, is, is a factor that has to be borne in mind. Um, it will inhibit people, um, some people. It will be less inhibiting to others. Um, so uh, you make a fair point, but I'm, I'm, there is no statutory right now. Thank you. Uh, right. I'm, I'm, we're moving to the end, but we've still got some questions to do, but let's try and just... Keep them very, very tight. Fiona. Um, okay, I'll try really hard. Um, first thing before I forget <coughs> is in the foreword to your annual report, you said that um, the code is supported by a handbook of statutory guidance. Can we get a copy of that? I should have done it before today, but... Yes. Thank you. Um, start with the good bits. I was really pleased to hear about HES and using simulations rather than just straightforward interviews. Um, experience, the Fife NHS example, brilliant, because experience isn't about experience about being on a board, it's about experience that you bring to the board. So really pleased to hear about that. Um, but can then I then go to, if diversity delivers works, if it's okay when we wrote it in 2008, then why are we looking at the figures that we've got on table 26? If it's had six years to deliver diversity, why is it only delivered for the group entitled disabled? And you talked about women being a particular problem. Can you split down your rise for disabled representation from 2.4 to 13 per cent? Can you give us that split into gender as well? Because if women are the problem, how have we got through to one group that we've not got through to women and we've not got through to black and minority ethnic groups? Um, so that would be one of my first questions. I, I hope you'll be prepared to give us the opportunity to write to you Absolutely. with that split because I, I don't think we have that with us this morning. Um, and I think your question, uh, if I may paraphrase, is if diversity delivers works, which I'm arguing it could do or should do, why has it not done so up to now? Um, I have two answers to that. One is that it has only been partially implemented um, and there has been some progress. The second answer is that it requires resources to be applied. Uh, and I think some of these are simply not available or have not been available up to now. Um, to come back to where we started, the process is run by a bureaucracy. G government is a bureaucracy, I think, as far as I know. All governments I've encountered are bureaucracies. Um, so there's a tendency in any bureaucracy 
uh, for things to be standardised, for processes to be established, because it's more cost-effective to do things that way. Um, and what Diversity Delivers argues for <coughs> um, is a variation in approach. Um, so that is fairly difficult for a bureaucracy to take on board. Um, and it requires time to be set aside, so uh, because thought is required for all the things we've been discussing already. Um, uh, and that means that the whole process has to start earlier, which means it has to compete with other things which are more immediate. Um, and as you as politicians know, um, it's difficult to ignore the immediate uh, problem in order to concentrate on one which isn't yet a problem but might become one if you don't address it now. So th there's a balancing of, of resources which I don't think has been achieved sufficiently um, to allow the recommendations to be fully implemented. Okay, can I ask for um, another piece of information which on table 26 you've got the comparison figures of 2004-05, Could we get the figures from 2008, just, you know, the transition between diversity, before diversity delivers and afterwards? Yes, we'll request these okay, and provide them to you. Okay, that would be interesting to see if there was a wee bit of a yep. change um, at that point. Can, well, one of the things following up is, I'm wondering if, you said that um, ministers in almost 50% of the um, round, rounds recently had appointed ind individual panel members. Do you think that is evidence that the ministers realise that they're not getting the diversity of um, ap appointments for them to, to go ahead and actually appoint? And that's why in 50% of the cases, the ministers are saying, actually, let's put an individual panel member on there. You talked about where they were being selected from and it was really quite creative and interesting. So again, I just come back to, is diversity delivers not working? And is that an example of it? The ministers are saying in 50% of the cases, we have to put an, indi uh, um, an independent panel member on there. Uh, I think, I mean, obviously we're, we're guessing here, but I, I think um, that's a reasonable presumption. Would it be worth asking them? <laughs> By all means, right. yes. Thank you. And then finally, just on applications, I mean, as I said when I started, it's great to hear things changing. I'd like more exam. I know you gave us a couple of examples, Ian. I'd like to hear more of those examples um, about, you know, the, the interview process, etc. But also about, um, is there any interesting ways that people are advertising um, the applications? I'm thinking of the children's panel where it's on bus shelters, yeah. radio, TV. It's adverts saying, I'm a panel member rather than be a panel member. Yes. Um, I'd like to hear more of that. Uh, and just before we come to Margaret will supplement that. Yes, I just wanted to come in and ask, you know, we were talking about young people and trying to get them involved. What about social media? Have you looked at that as a yes. way of um, advertising? Again, it's worth saying it's, it's not as though nothing has been implemented, but it's been piecemeal. So, you know, the PAWD did open a Twitter account just recently. Um, and it's dedicated to public appointments. We do have a dedicated public appointments website. So which, how recent was that, sorry? Uh, within the last six months. Right. Um, but, you know, it's a dedicated Twitter account. Um, those boards that operate Twitter accounts, you know, are meant to be following that one. They follow them. Uh, it's not my area of expertise, but, um, you know, there is someone dedicated. So new positions, whenever they come up, tweets go out about that um, so I mean yes you know things are gradually being implemented and we expect to see changes um, the key thing is learning from them as well though you know we've tried advertising in this way hasn't made a difference and I'd be very happy to provide you with some examples of what's been done differently particularly in the last year uh, I think there's some momentum now that perhaps there hasn't been yeah. Thanks. Convener, could I clarify uh, are you happy that these are Submitted after this meeting. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, we never expect every answer <coughs> to be written at the meeting. Cameron. Yes, sir. thank you. Uh, there's been a recent improvement in timescales for making public appointments. <coughs> what factors do you think have um, led to this? 
because we, they were criticised that making appointments which you felt were far too long originally. Now there seems to be there's a, um, a improvement in that. What factors do you think have led to that improvement? Um, I think part of it's awareness um, and obviously a willingness to, to, to improve the position. Um, I hope that part of it has been the uh, reduction in the extent of the supervision and the need to report and things. I think that assists mm. a little. Um, I think there are further improvements which could be made to the process. Um, we're particularly pleased that the um, time at which reappointments have been made um, has, if you like, been extended. In other words, people who are, have been reappointed have found that out sooner, sooner than yeah. they previously did, and obviously that's very beneficial to the individuals involved and probably to the organisations as well. So that involves, um, well, that's based on thinking ahead and, and, and planning sooner. Mm. Thank you. That's, that's, that's fine. That's awesome. Richard. Uh, thank you, Convener. Your, uh, your budget for 2013-14 was £797,000, but you actually overspent. Uh, your, your total expenditure was 811, and there are various reasons within the report because of the increase of, of complaints, etc. Now that you're getting um, an additional 12 boards which will be brought into your remit, uh, and a further two <coughs> boards which will likely come into your remit in the forthcoming year, do you, do you consider that this increase in appointments regulated by your office will, incre will lead to an increased work for your office and therefore increased expenditure? And also, if you get more complaints, um, you know, how, where do you see your expenditure going to be? The short answer is no. Um, I don't think that change will in itself um, put pressure on the budget. It obviously, I'm sorry, this sounds like a cop-out. It depends what else happens. Um, most of the pressure last year came on the uh, conduct complaints side, um, and the, uh, those additional 12 boards, those appointments have been made uh, without blowing the budget. Um, if you're asking about complaints about public appointments, um, and I'm not wholly clear that you are, but these only come to us uh, once the government itself has investigated. Um, so the exercise which we would be left with if, it's, if the person who complained is still dissatisfied uh, does involve a reasonable amount of investigating. Um, so that's that, that is quite uh, demanding in terms of resources. But I, up to now, there haven't been a lot, uh, and I'm touching wood as I say this. Uh, I hope that remains the position. Uh, the point I was really making was that you have all this extra pressure on you. Uh, additional complaints, possibly by councillors complaining yes. about councillors, uh, members of the public complaining about everybody, <coughs> and, and also the other pressures that uh, uh, the situation of, of you looking at the appointments and all the questions you've been asked. So, so you feel that you have sufficient funding? Well, that's a matter I have to discuss with the corporate body, obviously. Um, I my initial answer to your question was on the specific point of the additional boards coming yeah. uh, within our remit, um, and I don't think that in itself will cause a problem. Um, the overall, there is no sign of the overall increase in pressure reducing at the moment, um, and I have to give consideration to how I deal with that within the resources available to me, obviously. I'm sure you'll do it well, and I compliment me on your appointment. Thank you, Convener. Um, can I just uh, bring in one final question? Uh, ministers also get involved in um, appointments which are joint with other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom. And, I, and sometimes there has been different views taken by different jurisdictions as to who should be appointed. Um, do you learn from and work with the appointments process that applies at UK level? Because that's generally the process that applies to such appointments. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Um, there is contact. Um, it's fairly occasional. Um, we do obviously try and learn from experience elsewhere. Um, we're actually quite encouraged by some of the developments which have taken place fairly recently in both Northern Ireland and in Wales uh, in terms of trying to encourage greater diversity. Um, so yes, short answer is we learn where we can.
Okay, that's that's fine. It, I just uh, in in closing, um, talking about priorities and how we haven't implemented everything in two thousand eight. I I just remembered that one of my project managers said to me about twenty years ago that we only had three kinds of three priorities for our projects: top priority, urgent, and desperate. And and I thought that was very opposite. But what was particularly opposite is that the name of the person who gave me that was Teresa not turns. So at least we were doing a little bit 20 years ago in the domain I worked in. Um, is there anything more you would wish to say to us uh, before we bring this to a, a close that we haven't otherwise covered? Nothing other than thank you. Well, let me warmly reciprocate the thanks uh, for your time and uh, contribution. Um, there's quite a number of uh, things I think uh, we've seen resulting in a commitment that you will provide us with further information. I'll get the clerks to just check with you to make sure we have a shared understanding of what that is, and we look forward to uh, hearing from you in writing at a later date. Thank you very much indeed. I briefly suspend while we get ourselves organised for the next bit. Um, uh, agenda item four is uh, an update on CPGs. Um, members will note from the monitoring report the continued improvements in the overall level of compliance in the code. And uh, I'd like to put on record an update on the CPGs on Russia and the Scots language. The last monitoring report considered in May this year highlighted that those two groups were not compliant with the code in relation to membership. The committee raised concerns with the convener of both these groups, Rob Gibson, in an evidence session and agreed to allow the groups until after the October recess to address the committee's concerns. Rob Gibson has since informed the clerks that the group in the Scots language has decided to disband and that the group on Russia has recruited a new MSP member and so is now compliant with the rules on membership. Does anyone wish to uh, add any comments to that factual report? No, nope, nobody's in deep. Sorry? On those two? Yeah, just that specific one at the moment. Um, and then um, th th whether the committee wishes to take action uh, on any uh, non-compliant groups or indeed make any other remarks on the reports we've had, uh, bearing in mind we have something we'll cover specifically under the next agenda item. 
Anybody got anything they wish to say? You do, Fiona. Um, can I just say the bit about um, more groups doing joint working, I think is really good to hear. Um, overall, the compliance that's looking really good. Can I just ask us to keep an eye on construction and human trafficking? Um, because if construction's first attempt at an AGM was in Corey, I think we should be keeping an eye on that. And um, on human trafficking, um, a wee word to the, their secretariat. There, you can't have agree your AGM and then go and have a joint meeting with someone else on the date of your AGM and let your AGM fall. So just wee reminders to those two. But overall, I think it's good to see. Okay. Anyone else got any comments on this agenda item? Right. That's fine. Um, moving to agenda item five. Uh, this is for the committee to consider a change of name and purpose for the cross-party group on psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. arthritis. Uh, the convener of the CPG, Dave Thompson, has stated that the reason for the change is to give a platform to all skin conditions rather than just those associated with psoriasis. Uh, there are many such conditions which can be very debilitating. Does anyone wish to make any comments? Convener that I'm a member of this cross party group. Okay, that's duly noted, as good order to say that. No? Right, well, in that case, let me invite the committee to consider whether to approve the proposed name and purpose change the cross party group on psoriasis and uh, psori psoriatic arthritis. Agreed. Agreed. Right, okay, in that case, I will not. Is so anything else? Right, that appears to end the public part of our meeting. We'll now move into private session.